Hi there guys, it's Adam Martin here, and welcome to the first in this short series looking at my collection of Doctor Who Steelbooks. Now Steelbooks is a format, you know, they started off on DVD, then they went to Blu-ray. It's something I never really picked up on for quite a while, but then they released these. I mean, my favourite show in all these new packets with these new designs, and they look pretty damn cool if you ask me. So I'm going to take you through everything I have, and this first episode is going to be focused on the Russell T Davies era, or the RTD era for sure. And that era encompasses of the new show Series 1, Series 2, Series 3, Series 4, and the specials. So I think we shall start with where the Revive series began, which was Doctor Who Series 1. Okay, so there we are, Series 1 of the show, and very gorgeous cover, you know, this is all independent artists doing their job here and we can see it's Christopher Eccleston and Billy Piper on the front. It was new art as well, I really like it. It's sort of emphasising, you know, the whole do you want to come with me thing and it makes me think of like the Nana jeans in the background as well. It's just really gorgeous cover art, isn't it? And this has the older Doctor Who logo. At this point, this logo is being used for like everything that wasn't the current Doctor Who at the time, which I was always all right with. I never had much of an issue with that. And then look at that artwork on the back. How cool is that just going in there you've got some Daleks and you've got the TARDIS with the Bad Wolf graffiti on it which of course is the series arc it's so mad to think this was 15 years ago wasn't it but you've got all the episodes there so you have Rose the end of the world I'll just say Rose fantastic opener the end of the world uh, it gets a lot of hate but I actually quite enjoy it for what it is it's a bit of silly fun the unquiet dead a great spook thriller from Mark Gattis Aliens of London World War 3 not a bad story per se at all um, maybe had some misguided places like farting aliens Dalek, probably the best Dalek story of the modern series, debatably. The Long Game, a lot of people say this is the like big misfire of the series. I think it's sort of a great subtle setup to the finale. You've got Father's Day, which is a brilliant story by Paul Cornell exploring the relationship with Rose's dad. You've got The Empty Child, The Doctor Dances, the Stephen Moffat two-parter, which is one of his best, I think. I always thought he delivered better scripts when he wasn't the showrunner, you know, when he was just a contributing writer. Boomtown, again, featuring the return of one of the Celine from earlier. Not the greatest thing ever, but, you know, I think there's fun to be had in it. I love the banter between the, the regulars in it. And then you got the finale, which is Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways, one of the best finales of Doctor Who ever. I know it's very dramatic and very over the top in some places, but I loved that as a kid and I still love it now. Bear in mind, this was my first Doctor Who series, so I'm always going to have a lot of love for Series 1 no matter what. Bonus features on here, you've got Doctor Who Confidential, of course, that started the behind the scenes thing. You've got the commentary and interviews, you've got behind the scenes features and much more. Basically, from what I understand, everything that was on previous Blu-ray releases of this set is on here. I don't think we're getting anything brand spanking new, which is a shame, but I mean, considering this is just a re-release in Steelbook, we can't complain too much, I think. Just to note, the Doctor Who Confidentials here are the cut down versions. This always bugged me a little bit, so when Doctor Who Confidential aired, they were in half an hour slots, and then, like, whenever they repeated them, or if they put them on DVD, it was always the cut-down version, which was, like, 15 minutes, which I never got that personally. I always found it more annoying, but, I mean, I'm glad some record of them are on here to begin with. So, let's open up this, shall we? So, on the inside, there's not a great deal to show off. It's on three discs. One has, obviously, Chris Eccleston, one has Billy Piper, and the third has a Slitheen, because why not? The background there behind the disc is Doctor and Rose in the TARDIS. I think you can make out the outlines there. That's all there really is to it on the inside, but let's just look at that gorgeous artwork, man. Really gorgeous stuff. It did come with this little slip here, which is basically an episode guide on the back and a special features guide, which is useful. So that's Series 1 on Steelbook. Really great series. The best way to restart Doctor Who, in my opinion. Again, it was my very first Doctor Who series. I've always loved it, and I think I will always continue to love it deep down. It has its flaws, as does every Doctor Who series, but Christopher Eccleston, man, I wish we got more on TV. We've got him in Big Finish next year, and I'm sure that's going to be great. Onwards now to the new Doctor, which is Doctor Who Series 2, where David Tennant takes over as the 10th Doctor, and we've still got Billy Piper as Rose. Looking at this artwork, I do I do like it. There's some nice colour blends in here. The, the interpretations of the Doctor and Rose here aren't my... Favourite per se. I don't know what it is. There's just something about it which is a little off-putting to me, but it's still very striking art nonetheless. So if we shimmy this on over, swivel it around. They're still using the old logo, keep in mind. So starring David Tennant and Billy Piper. This is really cool artwork with the Daleks and the Cybermen here. I really, really do enjoy that. So you've got the Christmas Invasion, which of course was David Tennant's first, the Christmas 2005 special. 
All right, in retrospect, there are better Christmas specials, but still a lot of fun to be had. New Earth. I always thought this was like a great opener for Series 2. I know a lot of people dog on it, but I... I I, I didn't understand why. I quite enjoyed it. Tooth and Claw. I never... See, this is the thing. I never enjoyed this much as a kid. I don't know what it was. In hindsight, you know, I find it more enjoyable now. But, but even back then, I wasn't too enamoured. School Reunion. Great way to introduce Sarah Jane Smith and K9. I already knew a bit about them because by this point, I was delving into classic Doctor Who territory. But I think to reintroduce them to people who didn't know them, it was a great way to do it. You got The Girl in the Fireplace, which is a beautifully written script, rarely heartwarming and heartbreaking. You've got the two-parter Rise of Cybermen, The Age of Steel, which is debatably the best Cyberman story of the revival. Just the way they tell it in this parallel world, the other way the Cybermen were created, it's absolutely brilliant. Lots of emotional moments too. The Idiot's Lantern. Now, a lot of people dog on this, you know, the whole wire thing. I mean, it's it's revolving around like 50s TVs and stuff, so of course, it's like my alley. I don't know. I I mean, I had it on DVD as a kid, and I enjoyed it. I, I don't get the hate around it. You got the Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. Again, a great two-parter featuring the devil, or the beast, as he's known. You've got Love and Monsters. Love and Monsters doesn't deserve all the hate, man. I loved it as a kid, and I still enjoy it now. I, I don't... Why don't people like it? Let me know in the comments. Fear Her. Fear Her gets an un, ununiformly bad rap. It's like almost almost always bottom of like, you know, top Doctor Who list. And again, it's not the greatest story ever, but it deserves better than that, I think. Then you've got the finale, Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. The big team up, or I say team up, the big fight between the Daleks and the Cybermen. I'm sure kids of the 60s were thrilled about this. And it was, it's a great finale. Again, nowadays, some people say it's way too over the top. It's blown out of proportion. I thought it was an absolutely brilliant way to end the series. It was a brilliant way to... Uh, exit Rose's character for the time being at least honestly if you haven't seen them then you've probably had them spoiled at some point but go and watch them absolutely brilliant stuff the extras is listed the same as series one so you know confidentials documentaries behind the scenes commentaries features etc so more of the same on there but let's have a look at what's inside okay so once again you have the little like sleeve thing here which is basically detailing what's on focus basically detailing what's on what disc very useful and then uh, once more it's on three discs it's not flipped over they're sort of stacked on each other this time which is you know fair enough and interestingly this copy um came with uh, this which is some some different art cards which is really cool now my copy of series one uh, didn't have this and i don't know if all of the seasons do we'll have to find out as we go but a cool little feature nonetheless and just have a look at that artwork. Again, I really like like the colours and the way they're all intertwined here. But there's just something about the two character models that I'm just not a fan of. Now we trundle on to 2007 for Doctor Who The Complete Third Series. Starring Martha Jones as companion. And just to note at this point, I will talk about the price of all these. But I'm going to save that until the end. Now I remember when they announced this set. Uh, the cover originally, like sort of in the left, had the Master on it as well. Who is in this series. But they use like an image of... The master from the end of time which is not this season and now there was a big furore about that and he got removed so it is just the 10th doctor and martha again i love like the purple hues the 10th doctor looks great martha looks great i wish they sort of shared the box a bit more and that there was more sort of stuff filling the space it feels quite empty but that could have been because they took the master out etc once more still using the uh, classic doctor who logo i think this would be the last time they'd do that for one of these sets so let's spin it around Starring David Tennant and Freema Adjiman. And there's the master, the, the correct master if you like. And you got the TARDIS being shaken by the Weeping Angels because they pop up here too. So the Runaway Bride, uh, the one with Catherine Tate as Donna Noble. Uh, yeah, I prefer this one to the Christmas Invasion. And don't have much more to say on it than that. You got Smith and Jones, great introduction for Martha. I watched this recently. And a nice introduction for the Jadoon race as well. The Shakespeare Code, I haven't watched this one in a very long time. I do remember finding it great fun. And I think we were studying Shakespeare at the time. And my teacher had to point out that, you know, despite what was on Doctor Who, witches were not around back then. Um, you have Gridlock, which has the macra. I have a lot of love for Gridlock. I think some of the emotional themes explored in it are quite complex and, well, for Doctor Who anyway, and they're quite deep. Daleks in Manhattan, an evolution of the Daleks. Daleks in 30s New York. Um, I liked it. I like the whole Dalek set hybrid. I like the whole atmosphere of it. Yes, there are some really corny moments, like, you know, the song that Tallulah sings and all that. But I again, I enjoy these episodes. I enjoy a lot of Doctor Who. I know it sounds like I love everything. You know, rest assured, there are some stories I enjoy less than others like the Dominators, but there's a lot of New Who that I just enjoy. The Lazarus Experiment, again, as I've watched it when I'm older, I enjoyed it a lot more than when I was a kid. I think when I was a child, I was a bit 
Like, oh, yeah, that happened. But I really love Lazarus' experiment. 42, Chris Chibnall's uh, contribution to the show. I loved 42. I thought it was quality drama, that whole ticking time thing. I, and people dog on it now, probably because, you know, he's showrunner. But I thought it was good then, and it's good now. Human Nature and the Family of Blood, one of the best Doctor Who stories ever. And, I mean, the polls reflect that, too. The whole idea of the Doctor becoming human, hiding his identity. I mean, it was originally a novel by Paul, Paul Cornell, so check that out as well if you can. But this double parter is amazing. You have Blink, the introduction of the Weeping Angels. Again, as a kid, I never understood the hype. Although watching it as an adult, it's a brilliantly crafted story by Stephen Moffat and you need to watch it. It's essential viewing. Then you've got the finale, Utopia, The Sound of Drums and The Last of the Time Lords, which works to the return of the master. And yeah, I mean, I think, again, when I was 11, I preferred the Dalek Cyberman finale because, you know, monsters. But by this point, you know, I knew who the master was from watching Classic Who. I knew sort of his backstory, why he was there and the history between them. And I thought they explored the chemistry between the Doctor and the Master as characters really, really well. So props to David Tennant and John Sim for that. Special features are the same. You got Doctor Who Confidential. You got Music and Monsters, which is, is seemingly new. Deleted scenes, outtakes, commentary. You've got Freeman's Tour of the TARDIS, video diaries and more. So lots crammed on here, which is always really nice. But let's open this up and see what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so the inside is pretty much similar to the Series 2 set where the discs are stacked on each other there. And you've also got the little uh, slip as well, which details what's on each disc. Again, very useful. No art cards with this one, though. I wonder if it was a thing throughout all these sets when they were new or if it was just, you know, something they did for a certain one. I don't know. You have to let me know in the comments. And once more, taking a look at that particularly gorgeous artwork. I mean, if there was ever a, you know, a great shot of David Tennant, that is it. That is a brilliant shot of him. All right, moving on to Series 4 from 2008. And look at that cover. you got the Doctor and Donna, the best of friends on there. I love, again, this color mix. You know, the mix of reds and oranges in there. Absolutely stunning. Really, really happy with the way this one looks. And look, they're using the current, at this point, Doctor Who logo from Jodie Zero. That's when they started putting the modern logo on all the merchandising. Is it a bit annoying to an extent? Yeah, kind of. But I'm not overly enamored about it. It just means the spines or the front covers don't line up. But... Hey, there are worse things, aren't there? So great cover, and we'll twizzle you on over, and we will have a look at what's on here, although I think you can expect what's on here. But look, you've got the TARDIS and the Daleks and Davros, Davros on there as well. So, yeah, Voyage of the Dam, the 2007 Christmas special featuring Kylie Minogue. Great, absolutely great. Lot of fun, lot of fun at Christmas as well. I know it's one that my family probably enjoyed the most as well, so I highly recommend that. Partners in Crime, a great introduction for the Doctor and Donna again. Fires of Pompeii, wonderful exploring, you know, about the history and how time travel plays its role into it. And of course, has later implications. Planet of the Ood. I need to rewatch this one again because there's a lot of it I've forgotten. I do remember there being some quite shocking moments, like someone turning into an Ood. But I do need to revisit it. You have the Sontaran Stratagen and the Poison Sky, the return of the Sontarans to great spectacular fashion. Again, really fun. My 12-year-old self was overjoyed seeing the Sontarans because by that point I'd watched all their classic Who stuff. You have The Doctor's Daughter, starring uh, Georgia Moffat, who later became David Tennant's wife. So The Doctor's Daughter became his wife. Hmm, that's a bit weird. But um, I, again, I like this one for the time. There was nothing wrong with it. A lot of people dog on it now. But again, I can watch it and enjoy it. You have The Unicorn and the Wasp, where they meet Ag Agatha Christie. This is another one like Planet of the Ood I need to rewatch because it has been a very long time and I feel there's so much of it I've forgotten. So that is on my rewatch list. You have Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead, a two-part by Stephen Moffat, introducing River Song, who of course would be very important later down the line in the Moffat era. And yeah, again, this is a wonderfully fantasy, sci-fi, timey-wimey storyline, one of Stephen Moffat's best. Again, proving in my opinion why I think Stephen Moffat's scripts are better when he wasn't the showrunner. You have Midnight, which is a mainly Doctor-centric episode, one of the creepiest Doctor episodes ever. It's one I often show people who want to get into the series. And then the three-part finale, if you want to call it that, Turn Left, The Stolen Earth, and Journey's End. So Turn Left is mainly Donna-centric, and it, again, wonderful exploration of like the whole what-if concept if she never met the Doctor. And then the remaining two parts are the big fight with the Daleks who want to destroy the universe. It makes it sound cliche, but it's really not. One of the best two parts in the show's history, definitely. Bonus features, you've got more confidential, you've got video diaries, you've got trailers and teasers, you've got deleted scenes, children in need time crash. Ah, yes, the collaboration with the fifth doctor peter davison that was always fun and commentary and more so that's really cool let's see how this looks inside 
Okay, so for this one, they've gone back to like the disc tray thing rather than stacking them. I mean, there are four discs this time, so maybe that's why they did it. And behind it is a the teaser image of the Doctor and Donna. You do have the little um, little paper thing which tells you what's on each disc. Very useful using that TARDIS blue wood panel. I see you. But let me just close this up so we can have one more look at that really gorgeous artwork of the Doctor and Donna. That is one big appeal of these steel books. I know a lot of people find is the artwork. They might not necessarily have much new to add content wise, but artwork wise, damn, they're gorgeous. Okay, and to wrap this one off, you have Doctor Who The Specials, which was a series of, I guess you can call it five stories that summed up David Tennant's time as the, as the Doctor. And this front cover, again, wonderful, showing him about to regenerate, which I guess was the whole point of the specials. That was what they were leading to, was to lead to him changing. Again, they're using the uh, new logo, as is to be expected at this point. And if we twizzle it round, let's see. Oh, it's nice they've listed all the companions on the star in. So you've got David Morrissey, Michelle Ryan, Lindsay Duncan, Johnson, and Bernard Cribbings. So the episodes here, you have The Next Doctor, which was the 2008 Christmas special. You have Planet of the Dead, which starred Lady Christina, who's getting her own big finish spin-off. The Waters of Mars, one of the greatest singular episodes of Doctor Who ever, and I guess the basis for the whole Time Lord Victorious thing that's going on. And The End of Time, Part 1 and 2, the David Tennant finale. People seem to be really split with the finale. They either think it's really brilliant and love everything about it, or they absolutely despise it. I'm in the former camp. I was really sad to see David Tennant go. You know, he was a, my doctor in many respects. So to see him leave was quite sad, but I thought it was well-crafted. Let's just talk about this art here. Look how beautiful this is. You've got the Master, you've got Rassilon, Cybermen, Donna, Wilf. Oh, there's, just, there's so much to love about this artwork, man. Really love it. Bonus features. You've got Doctor Who at the Proms, which was a great ceremony. I remember watching that. David Tennant's video diary. The Christmas Ident. So, of course, Ident fans. Doctor Who led the Christmas Ident for 2009. Doctor Who at Comic-Con, deleted scenes, Doctor Who Confidential and audio commentaries. Now, this actually has a bonus disc, which I believe does contain new material. Or new material, maybe not released on the special set. So you've got Dreamland and Infinite Quest, which was two anime adventures. Uh, I, I remember Dreamland. I quite enjoyed that. I never watched Infinite Quest all the way through, but I've heard it's really good. You've got The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith, parts one and two, which is great. Those are two parts from the... Sarah Jane Adventures, where David Tennant appeared. I'm really glad they've put this on here, because at the minute, I don't own the complete Sarah Jane Adventures on DVD. I don't know why, but I don't. So it's nice to have the option to watch this part here. And you've got In Conversation with David Tennant, which was recorded in 2019. And I don't think that's been released on disc before this. So again, really cool that we have some new content on here. And I suppose they had to, considering this only had five episodes instead of the usual 13 or 14. So... I'm really glad they bolstered up the content. But let's open this up and see what it looks like on the inside. Now, it looks like there are two discs, but there's actually four. And what they've done is they've stacked them on top of each other. And I never like it when DVDs or Blu-rays do this because it invites potential for scratching. But, you know, there's nothing much I can do about it really, is there? And they have got the slip as well using the modern logo there and detailing what is on each disc. And not using the TARDIS blue, which is interesting. But again, I like that design. Let's close that up one more time to have a look at this fabulous artwork of the man that was the 10th Doctor. Okay, so we've looked at each steelbook, and now the question really is, where can you get these and how much do they cost? Well, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Similar to the collection sets they've been releasing on Blu-ray of the classic series, these are indeed limited edition. None of these are widely available, still brand new in stores like HMB, or anywhere like that. They might be available in, in some online stores, you know, if you check if, they've, if they're clear in stock or whatever. I did see Series 4 in a HMV. There was like one copy left, so I grabbed that for £30. That is the base price of these all the way. They're about £30 in like their worth. Uh, similar with the specials, I got very lucky. These three I had to go on eBay to get. Thankfully, Series 3, I didn't have to pay much more than £30. Uh, series 2 was a, a bit more than that, but nothing too crazy. Series 1 is the big one. Now, if you go on to CEX, you know, the trading in place here in the UK, if you want to buy it from there, it's going to cost you over £150, which is absolutely insane. I don't know why the price has been inflated to that height, but alas, it has. So if you want a copy, it's similar to that on eBay as well. So you're going to have to shell out a pretty penny. Thankfully, I didn't shell that much. I chatted with a friend of mine who happened to have a spare copy because he ordered two at the time it came out, you know, when they when they were 30 quid. And I managed to get a copy off him for less than, well, it wasn't triple figures, let's put it that way. 
So I was very lucky, you might get lucky too. Ask around, ask your friends, ask people you know who collect Doctor Who stuff, they might have a spare line around. So with these, for the old RTD era, you will mostly be going second hand, I'm afraid, unless someone's selling new stock. What I will make very clear is, like I said, aside from the specials, which has that whole bonus disc with like the David Tennant conversation, everything, a lot of, if I think most of the content on these sets has been previously available on Blu-ray releases, DVD releases, etc. You'll mainly be getting these for how gorgeous they look and some new content as well. <laughs> Hey there guys, it's Adam Martin here, and welcome back to another installment of my Doctor Who Steelbook Collection. And this time we are taking a look at the Stephen Moffat era, or what has been released of it so far anyway. Now I'm going to make this clear, the lighting in this video might be a bit all over the place because this pesky series, Series 7, arrived today. I'm actually recording this probably about an hour before I'm going to attempt to post it to YouTube, so it's all a bit of a rush. And I had to record the other steelbooks earlier in the day just to save myself some time. So if the lighting jumps about or quality of the sound or anything, that is why. But we have four steelbooks to look at today, looking at Series 5, Series 6, Series 7, and Series 10. Why the gap? Well, all will be revealed as we go along. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so first up we have Doctor Who, the complete fifth season, which is the first season to star Matt Smith as the 11th Doctor and Karen Gillan as Amy Pond, as you can see on the front. Now, this season is quite revered amongst fandom. A lot of people cite it as the best of the modern Who era. I've got to be honest, I've always found this season a little bit, if not a lot, overrated. There's some cracking stories, don't get me wrong, but me, myself, I've never personally found this a favourite. And I could say that really for the whole Matt Smith era in general, but hey, I'll delve into that in depth another time. That's a topic for another video. But look at this steelbook. The cover is absolutely gorgeous. You've got the uh, painting, like the cracked thing of the TARDIS exploding with our two central characters in the fray. The Sonic is looking glorious, glowing its bright green. And this artwork was done by Sophie Cowdery, who's a very, very talented artist. I highly recommend you go and follow her on Twitter and Instagram. Check out her work. You can buy a lot of her work on her Etsy page and her Redbubble page. And as we're approaching Christmas, come on. A lot of us Whovians need a good art print for Christmas. So go and check out Sophie's stuff. She's done an absolutely phenomenal job, as she has done with this. It looks amazing. And if we skim on over to the back, we will see just exactly what is on here. As always with these sets, you've got some gorgeous artwork on the back that sums up the season. So you've got Weeping Angels, Silurians, River Song, a young Amy Pond, Rory, uh, the Daleks, both the old kind and the paradigm. <laughs> the, the paradigm. And just below the paradigm, which you'll see as I pan down a bit later, you will see the crack, the famed crack in time, that would sort of dominate in many ways the Matt Smith era, for better or worse. So, episode starring Matt Smith and Karen Gillan, you have the 11th hour, the intro episode, often seen as, again, one of the greatest episodes in Modern Who. It's certainly a very uh, strong story to introduce a Doctor, I'll give it that, but I really don't think it's much more than that. The Beast Below, Episode 2, a really strong second part, I'd think, actually. A lot of people at the time, I remember, discounted it. I think it's a lot of fun. Victory of the Daleks, of course, introduces these boys here as the new paradigm. And I remember at the time, yes, some of the colours maybe are a bit too bright and play school for the Daleks. But in terms of the episode, I love the interactions with Churchill. You know, obviously the Doctor has a history, but it was nice to see him played by Ian McNeese. You had some great uh, chemistry between the leads here. Matt Smith did a phenomenal job in his third episode. It was the closest it came in this season for me to saying he is the Doctor, but I actually said that a lot later down the line, but we'll get to that. You have the first two-parter being the Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone with the Weeping Angels. And yes, it's a very uh, interesting episode. Admittedly, I haven't watched it in quite a long time. I do need to give it a rewatch. But I, I think for me, uh, the Weeping Angels created such a strong presence in Blink in David Tennant's time that this began the trend of reusing them a lot. So I, I, but I do need to give it a rewatch. You have the Vampires of Venice, which I always thought was a bit middling. Uh, Amy's Choice, really cool concept. Uh, to Toby Jones is the Dream Lord, fantastic. You've got the Hungry Earth and Cold Blood, a Silurian two-parter. Again, I think it really brings the Silurians into the 21st century, as New Who has done for a lot of monsters, so big points for that. You have Vincent and the Doctor, which is a phenomenal episode. Um, I do need to re-watch it again, but I remember the last time I watched it, I still loved it as I did then. Really cool. You've got The Lodger, which was originally based on a David Tennant comic strip. James Corden's in this. 
And I always usually say James Corden is only good in Gavin and Stacey and not much else, but I'll give him some credit. He's not awful in this. He's not as bad as he could be. And then you got the finale, the Pandorica opens, and the big bang. Um, I never really found this finale too spectacular on broadcast. Having said that, in the Russell T. Davies era, finales were all about, you know, hugeness and bombast, whereas Moffat didn't always necessarily favor that, and I respect that. But yeah, this finale on the whole just wasn't for me. But again, like a lot of this season, I do need to give it a rewatch. Okay, moving on to bonus features. So you have some Meanwhile in the TARDIS additional scenes. It's begun the era of adding little scenes here and there. You've got four the monster files. You've got a, a video diary. You've got confidential cutdowns. Doctor Who Confidential was still going strong then. You have commentaries for a few of the episodes as well. You've got outtakes and over, over 20 teasers and trailers. Oh my goodness, that's a... A lot of teasers and trailers. I must admit, I think a lot of these, to my knowledge, were present on the original Series 5 release, both on DVD and Blu-ray before. And it's a bit of a shame that there isn't a more, like, you know, on the Classic Who DVDs, like, more expansive featurettes. I know they've got d confidential cutdowns, which are going to be 15-minute makings of, but I would have loved something a bit more expansive, especially as they were re-releasing this on Steelbook. It would have been nice to have, you know, just some extra features in general. Taking it out of its sleeve, you have a little slip, which I think, like all the others, details what's on what disc. Very useful. And you've got a promo for The Edge of Time, which at this point, when this set came out, was only available on VR services. Although I do believe they are redoing it for uh, consoles as well. And you've got a promo for A Childhood's End, a Doctor Who novel where written by Sophie Aldred, who plays Ace, and she meets the 13th Doctor, which I do need to check out. That would be really, really cool. As for the set itself, there's a look at it without the slipcover. Again, looking at Sophie Cowdery's gorgeous artwork here on the front and the back. That is beautiful. I really, really like that. In terms of the actual discs, I believe the, these designs were used in previous Blu-ray releases. Thankfully, they are not stacked. They are on these like flipbook design things, which I prefer much, much better. But yeah, I mean, uh, again, a lot of the reason people like these steelbooks is this gorgeous artwork. And let's just look at that. Look at that! So that is the contents of the season, or series 5 steelbook, I should say. In terms of where you can get it, it is still available new in some retailers like HMV, although that's becoming less and less. It did come out, I think, in February of 2020. These things are limited, and they will stop being sold as new. So if you want one, I'd advise checking your local uh, media retailer. You might still be able to get it on places like Amazon and Zoom for the retail price, but if you don't bag it now, it is going to start going up and up and up. Right, now we're moving on to Series 6. Ah, yes, everyone's favourite. A very divisive season. But first of all, the cover. Again, this has been done by Sophie Cowdery, and she's done a phenomenal job. I love the fact that green is the main hue here, both, again, of the Sonic, but also the background. It's actually probably the best Series 6 art I've, I've seen in general. I love the fact you've got the regulars, so Matt Smith, Karen Gillan, Arthur Darville, and Alex Kingston. And you've got the TARDIS in the background. You've got the little scribblings, you know, there marking the silence as well. I actually like that they haven't gone with a villain on the front. You've still got the main TARDIS team. It's just a really awesome design. And Sophie's done another phenomenal job. First of these to have the new ratings logo on as well. Twizzling it round. Oh, look at that. Let's take a look at this artwork, shall we? Once again, beautiful use of artwork from the season. You've got members of the silence. You've got Madame Kavarian. I think that was her name. You've got the astronaut with the reflection being of the Doctor regenerating. And you've got... Idris, or or the TARDIS, or the Doctor's wife, if you like. Many, many possibilities, but yeah, love that. And I love on this one, it says, starring Matt Smith, Karen Gillan, Arthur Darvill, and Alex Kingston, recognising that all three of them are somewhat regulars in this, so all, all you people in Jodie's era, oh, there's three companions. You could argue there was technically three on-off companions in this series. This was all first broadcast in 2011, bar the first thing on here, which is A Christmas Carol, the 2010 Christmas special. It's a, uh, yeah, it's lovely. It's probably the most Christmassy, or makes me feel the most Christmassy out of them. I don't always look for uh, Christmas specials to necessarily be about Christmas, but I thought this one uh, took the Dickens uh, concept and worked around it really well with Doctor Who. Then with Series 6 itself, you've got The Impossible Astronaut, Day of the Moon, which I actually appreciate more the more I watch it and as I get older. Curse of the Black Spot, it's often seen as one of the weaker parts of the season. I'm inclined to agree. Doctor Who does pirates sort of well, sort of not. You've got The Doctor's Wife, which was written by Neil Gaiman and is actually one of the best episodes of the Matt Smith era. The idea of the TARDIS becoming a, a, a sentient, well, she is sentient, but like a humanish form is really, really cool. Saran Jones is amazing. One of the best episodes there. You've got The Rebel Flesh and Almost People, which I'm going to say this, and I know a lot of people might come after me for it. 
I honestly thought is one of the dullest two-parters in New Who history, both on broadcast and on rewatch. It's just, yeah, it doesn't engage me that much, to be honest. Then you've got A Good Man Goes to War, which was the part one of this series finale. They split it in two, which I still think was a bad decision. It's a bit of a jumbled mess. It does set some things up, has some big reveals, but ultimately, is it good uh, in parts, I think? Uh, let's Kill Hitler. Again, interesting idea. Maybe not best in concept. Night Terrors is a really cool horror-esque episode. I really enjoyed that one, actually. You've got The Girl Who Waited, one of the best episodes of this series. Karen Gillan does an amazing performance throughout. You've got The God Complex, which has, again, great ideas, but for me just wasn't executed in necessarily a good way. So, yeah, sorry, Series 6 fans. You've got Closing Time, where they brought James Corden back. It just feels like they're trying to do The Lodger Part 2, but without the lodging, and it just feels a bit cheap and a bit rushed and a bit bleh, and the Cybermen are absolutely wasted. And you've got The Wedding of River Song, which attempts to tie everything up. It does that to a degree, but I just remember a lot of people found it very confusing. You know, like Joe Bloggs just tuning in, like my parents, for example. I found it a bit confusing at first uh, as a fan. It's not that bad as everyone makes it out to be, but yeah, just on the whole, this season has a few gems, but in my opinion, quite a few misfires. In terms of bonus features, you've got five Knight and the Doctor additional scenes, which I actually quite like those. You've got comic relief sketches, you've got audio commentaries, you've got monster files, prequels, trailers. You've got uh, all the confidential cutdowns, so 15 minute versions of them. And you've got a, a confidential cutdown for a Knight's Tale as well. So again, features that were present on uh, past releases, which on one hand is, you know, to be expected. Um, I don't, I'm not seeing anything that's necessarily new, which again is a bit of a shame. I would have liked a bit more of an expansive, or even if they made a new documentary of some sort for this set. But I, I guess, you know, maybe they're on a budget, they're re-releasing these, mainly for the steelbook and nice quality. So the only thing that comes with this one, no promos for the media, is just a little slip detailing what is on the set, which is fine. You know, I'm, I'm all for not having adverts in my steelbooks all the time. Just looking at this before we open it, another example of Sophie's gorgeous artwork there. I'd love a frame of that. That'd be phenomenal. And look at that on the back. Oh, man. Some people, you know, just display these for the art, and I can see why, because it's gorgeous. Opening the thing up, you have the discs here, and you might be thinking, why is there only two? Well, unfortunately, there isn't. These discs are stacked. And you didn't see it on camera, but when I first opened this, the Christmas Carol disc just fell out, because... The thing with stacked discs is they do fit, but they can come off way too easily and they're a bit flimsy. So I'm a bit gutted they cheaped out on that front, but you know, all the discs are here. So that is the Series 6 Steelbook in a nutshell. Again, not my favourite season, not a lot of people's favourite seasons. Uh, a bit of a case of, I think, too many ideas. The whole season split, leaving a few months gap was not a good idea in my view. There are some gems, Doctor's Wife, Girl Who Waited, but ultimately this is not a series I go back to often. It's just not for me, and it further pushed me further away from the whole sort of Matt Smith era. Okay, so here is the pesky newcomer, Doctor Who, the complete seventh series. Now, as I said at the beginning, this literally arrived today as you're seeing this, so apologies for any lighting changes or audio changes. It's been a pretty hectic day trying to cobble this video together. But yes, this came out today, and it is the seventh series of New Who. And again, some gorgeous artwork from Sophie Cowdery, who I mentioned earlier. Please do check out her stuff. This is absolutely incredible. What I love is the front half is the first part of Series 7, because like Series 6, they split it in two. And the back half is summarizing Series 7B. It's more detailed on the inside as well. But on the front, you've got the Doctor Amy and Rory, the Doctor still rocking his tweed. You've got Weeping Angels Plenty and a Dalek in chains and a dinosaur because that episode happened. Oh, and the cubes are at the bottom, lest I forget. It's five discs this release, and I'm going to spin it round, and we're going to take a look just what is on here. So as you can see, some of the Series 7B artwork on the back. You've got Matt Smith, Jenna Coleman, you've got the Whisper Man, you've got a Cyberman as well, and you've got uh, the Great Intelligence and a Nice Warrior, nice little mix there. This was, of course, the 50th anniversary season, or the second half was of it anyway. So to go through the episodes, we have The Doctor, The Widow and The Wardrobe, the 2011 Christmas special. A lot of people don't like this one. I think it's got a lot of heart. It's certainly one of the least memorable of the New Who Christmas specials, but very enjoyable nonetheless. You have then Series 7 starting. You have Asylum of the Daleks, where Jenna Coleman actually makes an early debut. I always quite liked it, although I wish they pushed the concept further with showing every Dalek and just focusing more on the Daleks, really. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship is just a fun romp. You know, it's obviously taking the mick out of snakes on a plane. A lot of fun. Mark Williams' Rory's Dad is fantastic. Um, not a bad Chibnall script, in my opinion. 
A town called Mercy, Doctor Who does a western, but guess what? It's not the gunfighters. Um, I think it's better than the gunfighters. Not that that one's bad. And there's some really good character moments for Matt Smith's Doctor as well. And you have a cool villain too in the gunslinger. Then you have the power of three, the cubes. I did like the concept of this one. The cube concept I thought was really cool. The ending is horrifically rushed, and I know I'm not going to lay into that more because it's been beaten to death at this point, but yeah, not the strongest story. Then you have the Angels Take Manhattan, which sees Amy and Rory leave for good. Um, it has Weeping Angels, it has River Song. It's basically like a culmination of all this character work we've been doing with River Song, the Ponds, and the Angels. It's like a... It could have ended like Matt Smith's Doctor there if he decided to go, but he's going to stay on. But it's a very definitive end of like the first chunk of the Matt Smith era, in my opinion. Then you have The Snowmen, the, the Christmas special for 2012, where Jenna Coleman appears once again as a different version of Clara. I'd argue this one is more forgettable for me than uh, The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe. I don't know what it is, it just doesn't really click with me, so not much more to say on that one. The Bells of St. John kicked off 7 Series B, as it's known, the second half of it. And it has Clara now as the Clara we know, the Impossible Girl thing kicks off. Not a strong start, in my opinion, but it's not terrible. Then you have the Rings of Akaten, which really split fandom. There are corners of fandom that really love this, and there are corners of fandom that really hate it. In fact, in the last Doctor Who magazine poll of all the stories available at the time, it actually placed in the bottom 10. It's not bottom 10 in my opinion, but it does have a few flaws. I do love the song, though. That concept's really cool. Cold War, featuring the new Who return of the Ice Warriors. Really cool story to reintroduce them. I love the concept of them coming out of the armor as well, which is sort of what they're doing with the Daleks now. But yeah, really cool story. You have Hyde which is sort of like a ghost story thing, and, you know, it's it's okay. Again, I, I didn't really find it that memorable, aside from a few lines here and there, and everyone saying, oh, Matt Smith said Metabilis wrong, you know, it's just, let's get over that, guys. Journey into the center of the TARDIS, again, this sort of movie poster title thing. Really cool concept. I wish it had been a two-parter, though. If it had been two parts, I feel they could have really delved into that whole, um, inside the TARDIS sort of thing, but they didn't, so that's a bit of a shame. You have the Crimson Horror, which was actually at the time when this broadcast was probably my favourite episode from the season. A lot of cool character moments, uh, the Paternoster Gang are great, you've got Diana Rigg as a great villain. Yeah, it was just my favourite, to be honest. Nightmare in Silver was alright, but again, this whole thing of making the Cybermen practically invincible, always upgrading, just made them a bit too powerful. There's less focus, again, on like the body horror of the Cybermen. Just not a good story for them. The Matt Smith here, I'd argue, wasn't kind to the Cybermen. And then you finish with the name of the Doctor, which, of course, cliffhangered into the 50th anniversary special. And the name of the Doctor is now going to have a unique distinction because it's both on this set and we know it's going to be on the 50th anniversary set too. So that's an interesting precedent there appearing twice. Of course, we must talk about the bonus features and we have some prequels. We've got behind the scenes, we've got commentaries, additional scenes, documentaries, exclusive content, a script to screen for The Good as Gold, which was a short, I believe. The Making of the Gunslinger, Pond Life, which was like a little mini sewed series thing, and Comic-Con. So yeah, nice features here. Again, to my knowledge, all of these have previously been available on Series 7 DVD and Blu-ray releases. I don't think we've got a new, like a brand spanking new documentary or anything like that, which is fine because that's not what these are really made for. But I just thought with the passage of time, even if they'd added one, you know, extra documentary or feature, I thought that could have been pretty cool. So with this steelbook, as always, you have the little uh, slip saying, you know, what this season is and what is on each disc, always useful. And this time we have an advert for Time Fracture, which is a theatre experience that will hopefully go ahead if this pandemic ever eases up. And on the back, oh, look at that, a handy dandy guide to Time Lord Victorious, the saga that's currently going on, which is admittedly quite useful. And when you open it up, you do have a little advertisement. So on the left, you've got calendars, a diary and greetings cards, which is always nice. And then you've got an advert for some Doctor Who games. You've got The Edge of Time, you've got The Edge of Reality, which I believe is the console version of The Edge of Time, and The Lonely Assassins, which is also coming soon. So really cool that Doctor Who's making a splash in the video game scene. Before we open it up, just another look at Sophie's gorgeous artwork there, really representing season 7A. And then on the back, there you go, a closer look at that Series 7B artwork where you've got the Doctor in his new purple coat, you've got Clara, the Whisperman and all that sort of stuff, and the TARDIS at the back there from Trenzalore. I really do adore this artwork, you know. Opening this up, sadly, the discs are stacked. I hate this stacked format. I wish they were still the flip thing. I guess they do it to save costs and save on plastic, which, you know, it's understandable. But again, you didn't see it on camera. I opened this up and one of these discs fell straight out, so they're not the most reliable way of storing media but hey we've still got these discs here and i believe these discs designs have been used before so nothing new there 
Overall, Series 7 for me is the mixed bag it was for many people, both when it broadcast and now. There are some really strong episodes in there, like for me it's the Crimson Horror being a shining example. But I think with the pressure of the 50th anniversary looming, even Stephen Moffat submitted this was the period in his showrunner tenure when he was really tired and worn out. And I'm not saying that's his fault for the decline in, in quality, but I remember a lot of people at the time saying they didn't enjoy it as much as, say, Series 5 or even Series 6 to some comparison. But there are some strong stories here, and I'm glad, like all the others before it, it has now a Steelbook release. And finally, we're going to be looking at this, Doctor Who The Complete... 10th series, Capaldi's final series as the 12th Doctor. And yes, for those who are eagle-eyed, there is a Series 9 steelbook that is available. It was released shortly after Series 9 aired in 2015. Unfortunately, it was very limited edition and now is very expensive. You literally have to pay hundreds of pounds to acquire it. And I do not have that kind of money and I'm not willing to spend that kind of money on a steelbook. So I did pass on that, but this one is more readily available. Taking the 2017 series, again, we've got some stunning artwork here. I love this portrait of Capaldi with all the, the mix of like the reds and greens and pinks. It just looks great. You can tell it was released before the new rebranding as it's got the Capaldi logo. This was released sort of late 2017, early 2018. So let's spin it around and see what is on here. Oh, you've got some nice artwork of Bill on the back there, who of course is the companion. So starring Peter Capaldi and Pearl Mackey. So they actually kicks off with the 2016 Christmas special, which is the return of Doctor Mysterio, which a lot of people lambasted when it came out. You know, Doctor Who does superheroes. It's trying to be the MCU. It's a bit cringe. It's not cringe. I find it very heartwarming. It's a very fun story. It's very rewatchable, especially around Christmas time. So I liked it. I really liked it. And then you've got the pilot, which of course is a double metaphor for a character in the story, but also they were trying this whole thing of, oh, we're relaunching Doctor Who for a new audience. And yeah, it's very accessible. Arguably, maybe a bit plain, but very accessible. Smile with the emoji robots. Um, yeah, interesting concept. Nothing amazingly stand out, but I liked it. Thin Ice, which is a really strong episode, taking us back to the uh, early 19th century in London. There's some great talking points about race there that I think Doctor Who does so well. You've got Knock Knock, an attempt at like a horror story and like a haunted house sort of thing. Some really cool scenes, some really cool moments. You have Oxygen, which is a contender for me as the best episode of this series. Really cool concepts, really cool ideas. The the thing of the Doctor becoming blind. Really interesting dynamic, and Capaldi just absolutely sells it. Then you've got a little trilogy. You've got Extremis, The Pyramid at the End of the World, and The Lie of the Land. Uh, my favourite was the middle segment. It's not the best trilogy in conception. I mean, a lot of people after Lie of the Land felt a bit burned or a bit cheated by a lot of things that were revealed. It's not awful, but I think it could have been helmed in a bit of a better way. You've got Empress of Mars, a return with, to, for the Ice Warriors. Uh, yeah, I liked it. Ice Warriors on Mars. I mean, it's the home planet. Of course we're going to see that at some point. The Eaters of Light, who, which interestingly was done by Rona Munro, who wrote Survival, the last story of the classic series. I think Survival's better. I do need to re-watch Eaters of Light, though, but I remember it being sort of a come-and-go episode. And then you're leading into the finale with World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls 2 amazing episodes. Two of the best of the Capaldi era, two of the best of the Modern Who era in my view. Absolutely brilliantly directed by Rachel Talalay. Uh, like all the finales really. Really interesting concepts. You've got Missy and the Master. You've got Cybermen. You've got the Tragedy of Bill. It's honestly two of the best episodes in the show's history and I implore you to go and watch them if you haven't seen it. Special features. Oh, it looks like we've got a bit more than the others although that could be you know, misleading. So you've got a Doctor Who Extra for the Return of Doctor uh, Return of Doctor Mysterio. Doctor Who Extra is basically confidential, but now 10 minutes instead of 15. You've got the Doctor, a new kind of hero. You've got Knock Knock, the binaural sound. Yeah, they tried this whole basically binaural sound. If you listen with, like, headphones, you get a better soundscape. But it was a really cool idea, actually. you got Becoming the Companion, Out of This World, Who's There, Rona Munro, a modern classic. The Finale Falls, huh? <laughs> nice. Inside Looks, Deleted Scenes, Audio Commentaries, Doctor Who, The Fan Show, which was like a little thing hosted by uh, Christelle D. Brilliant thing there. After Shows and Doctor Who, The Finale. Countdown. Okay, so it seems like there's a bit more than of the Matt Smith ones we've looked at. Again, like this came out toe-in-toe uh, -toe with the DVD and Blu-ray standard releases, so it's not a case of reusing special features. These were just the special features they, they had. Uh, again, you would have liked maybe... An exclusive special feature for the Steelbook variant, although I'm not too bothered that there isn't, considering it was released day and day. But um, yeah, those are your specials. Taking it out of its slipcase, you've got um, some art cards. I love some art cards. 
Here's this gorgeous one of Pcap himself, and when you, it might be a bit fuzzy, but there he is with his Sonic, and when you shim it, he's like his eyes close like a regeneration thing, really cool. That one, you've got one of, uh, well, John Sim morphing into, if it does it, into Michelle Gomez, that's really cool. And uh, the most tragic one, because you've got Bill, lovely Bill, who then turns into a Cyberman, and if you've seen the finale, you'll know what that's about. So yeah, really gorgeous art cards. I believe they released those with DVD and Blu-ray as well, so it's not a Steelbook exclusive. And then you've also got uh, 2018 Calendars and Diaries. So this did sort of come out, you know, end of 2017 for all your favourite BBC shows, and there's nothing on the back. So nice little advertisement. And there is the steel without the slip looking... Capaldi is just a gorgeous human being, isn't he? I've got a secret man crush on Capaldi, even though he's a good, you know, 35 years older than me, somewhat. But yeah, gorgeous artwork on the front, and on the back, you have that lovely artwork of Bill, a uh, full face this time, which is great. Bill was such a great companion, even though she was in one season, exactly like Martha for me. I loved her for one season. I would have killed to see more, and I'm still waiting for Free Magiman to do some big finish, and I would love it if Capaldi ever comes to big finish, if he does some stuff with Bill, too. And that, in a nutshell, is the Series 10 Steelbook. It's not my favourite Capaldi season. That would still be Series 8, his first one, which is still waiting a Steelbook release, although I'm guessing we're going to get one in 2021. But it is an, it's still a cracking series. So many good stories. Pearl Mackey is excellent as Bill. Capaldi friggin' soars as the 12th Doctor, man. He did that in his first series, in my opinion, but he just soars. He continues to do well. So I'm really happy we have a steelbook. Of course, now the question is, it doesn't include his final episode, which is Twice Upon a Time. And after that, you've got Jodie's era, which is already on a steelbook. So I'm wondering if they're going to do a re-release of the series 10 Steel with Twice Upon a Time. If they do, great, although I'll probably have to buy it again. But still, I, I would love it if they did that. And that, in a nutshell, is the Steve Moffat era of steelbooks that I currently own. In terms of where you can get these... Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag, so Series 7 literally came out today, the day I'm recording this today, you're hopefully seeing it, the 14th of December, so you can get that for its normal retail price of about $27.99. Series 6 is still available in a lot of retailers, I went into a HMV recently, they still had it new there, again, about £27.99. Series 5 is becoming less and less available new, these are all limited edition after all, so if you're lucky and you see it in the shops, get it now, because you can still get it for its base price, but if you miss out, then it is going to start increasing so i get it now if you find it series 10 i got off amazon and it was about 40 pounds so a little bit over the base price but can you know i think you can still get it for that price it's one of the easier new who steel books to actually find so if you're a capaldi fan if you want to get series 10 that's quite easy to get as well as i mentioned in the series 10 like look at the series 9 steel book is very difficult to come by because it's quite rare and expensive as of this video, a Series 8 Blu-ray steelbook has not been announced, although everyone's thinking it will come in 2021 because they've been pretty consistent so far. Obviously, we have a 50th anniversary steelbook to look forward to as well. That has been announced. No release date on that just yet, but obviously that will come before a Series 8 steelbook. So I will be picking all of those up, and rest assured when I do pick them up, I'll be making update videos or unboxing videos looking at those steelbooks as well. But that is it for this part. Join me next time where we're going to take a look at the two steelbooks that make up the Jodie Whittaker or Chris Chibnall era of Doctor Who so far. But until then, thank you very much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you're brand new. Remember to check out the first part if you haven't seen it. And let me know down in the comments, have you got any of these steelbooks? Are you planning on getting them? I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and until the next one, I shall see you next time. <laughs>Hi there guys, it's Adam Martin here, and welcome back to the third part of this series looking at my Doctor Who Steelbook collection. And after RTD and the Moffat era, we are now going into the Chibnall era, which at the time of recording is also the current era of Doctor Who, looking at Jodie Whittaker's tenure so far as the 13th Doctor. So at the minute we only have two Steelbook releases because she's only had two full series, which is fair enough, so we'll be looking at series 11 and series 12. So it only makes sense we will start with the first of those series 11. So let's have a look at this. I love this. This was sort of a spin on like the teaser images we got, you know, of Jodie in a costume or the silhouette of her looking at the TARDIS. I think it's a really gorgeous look and it really represents the the shift in like visual quality that Doctor was undergoing at the time with like, you know, the landscapes and panoramic shots and whatnot. So I really love this cover. I wish the thing could have been a bit more blue. It is a bit doled out. I know it's meant to be like a dusk sort of effect. I wish the blues could have just been a bit more prominent, but that's sort of by the by. So it's four discs on here. 
and of course using the current logo. You've got the little blurb about uh, the series, and you have Jodie Whittaker delivers a blockbuster performance from The Independent. I certainly thought she did. Meet the new Doctor. The universe just got more exciting. It includes over an hour of bonus content. Oh, do you remember when back in the day, like in the Russell T. Davies era, special features could be hours, not just one hour? I know they're filming a lot, but I just think sometimes they skimp out on special features. But what do we have? We have commentaries. We have uh, closer looks. You've got cast video diaries. You've got uh, becoming the Doctor, regenerating Doctor Who, directing Doctor Who, friends of the Doctor, everything you need to know about the new TARDIS, and making the theme tune, and the best of social. Best of social, yeah, okay. So apparently all that equates to over an hour. Um, I wish there was a bit more on here. I mean, Doctor Who Confidential is no longer a thing. But, you know, again, I'll take what I can get. So let's open this up and see how it looks on the inside. Okay, so here are your four discs, if I can move that. Oh, there you go. There are your four discs, which comprise of the the whole series. I'm amazed with only ten episodes. They had to stretch it out over four discs. I know it's including special features, but Blu-ray discs can hold a lot, man. So why it's you know why it's all been crammed in is is beyond me. But like the other steel books, you've got the little uh, slip here, which tells you what's on what disc. So it's a nice bit of continuity there. And you also have um, these, the art cards. Now, if you remember from uh, my previous parts in this series, some of the sets had art cards, some of them didn't. But I'm glad that they're here. I enjoy I enjoy art cards myself. Um, I'm just going to close this for now so we can have one more look at that gorgeous cover art. Look at that. Mwah! Molto bene! Now, I noticed you didn't... You might notice I didn't do an episode review thing because, well, normally they're on the back, but it isn't. But from memory, the, the woman who fell to Earth is a wonderful introduction for Jodie's character. The Ghost Monument was a bit of a lackluster follow-up, but... I enjoyed parts of it, nonetheless. Rosa, I thought, was a brilliant historical story, a really great look into the past. Arachnids in the UK had some good ideas, didn't necessarily pull all of them off. The Saranga Conundrum, I get why a lot of people don't like it. I personally enjoyed quite a lot of it. Demons of the Punjab, again, similar to Rosa, I love that sort of delve into the past, learning about elements of history I didn't learn about before, so really cool episode there. Episode 7, Kablam, obviously the whole riff of Amazon bad sort of thing. Again, nice concept, some bits could have been improved, but I, I still found it enjoyable. The Witchfinders, great guest from Alan Cumming as King James, whatever he was. I just thought he had a wonderful performance. It Takes You Away, I thought was a really good emotional one. I don't get why people dislike it. I know the frog, yeah, yeah, I know, but I, I really enjoyed it. And the Battle of Rangscore, Av Kolos, not the season finale we all expected and is it a bit lackluster yes is it terrible i'd argue not resolution isn't on here which aired shortly after series 11 but you'll you'll see that very soon don't you worry but yeah series 11 i thought was a great intro to jody's doctor and it's actually the most pure fun i had with doctor who in a very long time not saying anything in the matt smith or peter capaldi eras was bad but i didn't i didn't get as much pure fun like unfiltered fun from that as i did with this first series with jody so big up that. And now we move on to the most recent series at the time of filming this, which was series 12. And this artwork, man, look how gorgeous this is. Like, you got the Doctor and the Master, but the mix of, like, the red, orange, and purple hues. This this is just, this is gorgeous. Like, anyone who says this is bad artwork, I, I, I'd be like, why? What, do you, what don't you like about it? I think this is really well-crafted, brilliant. And it's got the complete 12 series there. And the resolution special, so that's where revolution is hiding. It's all the way over here. So we'll twizzle this round. And again, that's some great art of Graham, Yaz, and Ryan on there. And this just has a blurb, obviously, about what Series 12 was all about. And of course, this had some infamous moments, which we'll talk about in a bit. So here you have closer looks, audio commentaries, what to expect in Series 12, a Series 11 look back, resolution itself, or resolution behind the scenes, I should say, and a Dalek. Rearm. So again, like series 11 and like a lot of these steelbooks, the content on it isn't necessarily brand new. There's very little new here, but I mean, look at that artwork, man. Just so gorgeous. We're going to open it up now, see how it looks on the inside. So they keep flip-flopping as they've done this annoying thing again of stacking discs on top of each other. I will never understand what the reasoning behind this is, but alas, it's been done here. Uh, but all the discs are there. You have the little slip card, which gives you the information on what is on each disc, useful as ever. And look, art cards. And I love these like art styles of Jody here. I think that's really cool. So if you like art cards, you'll like this. 
We're just going to close this once more just so we can have another look at... Look at that. Uh, I wish... You know, I wish I'd get that framed and blown up. That's really cool art of the Doctor and the Master there. And really cool art of her three companions. Or the fam, I should say. Well, I won't go episode by episode here and what I think because I actually reviewed Series 12 at the time of broadcast in my Doctor Who review series. You can check that out as a playlist or you can check out individual episodes, basically where I just give my thoughts on each episode of Series 12, including everyone's favourite, The Timeless Children. But no matter what you think of Series 12, I think it's very hard to deny that the, the artwork is probably the best. It's one of, if not the best in my opinion, of the Steelbook artwork, just for how magnificent it looks. I really, really like the art style here. So that so far is the two Steelbooks of the Chibnall era. In terms of where you can get them from, I believe they are both Amazon exclusives and still are. I think you can still get them brand new. I mean, I got my two brand new for about um, 30, it was about 30 or 35 pounds, which sounds about right. They will go up. In fact, they probably have gone up a little bit already. So you might have to look on places like eBay or Facebook Marketplace if anyone local has them. But they aren't in like the stupid prices yet. They're not going for triple figures or higher. But as far as I know, Amazon exclusive for the time being. <laughs> Hi there guys, it's Adam Martin here, and welcome to the fourth and final part of my Doctor Who Steelbook collection. We've taken a look at the modern series, the Russell T Davies era, the Stephen Moffat era, the Chris Chibnall era, but now we're going back to the classics. We're looking at what classic steelbooks I own. Just a disclaimer, this isn't every classic steelbook ever released. Uh, to detail what I'm missing, I don't have the Sharda steelbook, which is the fourth Doctor story. I don't have steelbooks for either of the two Peter Cushing Dalek movies. They are available. I also don't have the steelbook for Spearhead in Space, which got a Blu-ray release on its own, because being shot on film, it could be released on Blu-ray, and they released the steelbook, which I don't have. So there are a few things I'm missing. I might have missed another one. I can't remember. But this is what I own of the classic lineup. All of them are Patrick Troughton stories. All of them have been fully animated, and we will go through each of them here. We're going to go chronological, so we will start with the first one, The Power of the Daleks. So here it is, The Power of the Daleks, the first story to feature Patrick Troughton as the Doctor. Now, of course, many fans will know that this got a release on home media twice. It was released in 2016 and then re-released in 2020 with better animation and more special features. This is the 2016 release. They didn't do a, a different steelbook because that would probably be seen as being a bit money grabby. But this artwork's really cool. I really like the mix of purples and whites here and all the Dalek silhouettes. I think it's a really cool motif to to go with. It's four discs, would you believe it or not? The Lost Classic Returns. It certainly did. Oh, this was so cool to see this animated in full. So disc one is the Blu-ray, which has episodes one to six in black and white. And it's got audio commentaries. It's got um, audio streams, animations, surviving footage, etc. Disc two is the episodes one to six in color because they started reanimating these in color as well. It's funny how in recent years, the color version has become like the more standard version they go with. But here, disc one is the black and white version. And you've got a telesnap reconstruction, which is a really cool way to listen to it. You've got episodes one to six in black and white on DVD and color on DVD as well. So basically you've got two Blu-rays and two DVDs. I guess they did this to give you the option if you wanted the steelbook, but maybe didn't own a Blu-ray player. Alas, but we will look at what it looks like inside. Okay, so nice and straightforward. You've got the two Blu-rays there and then you have the two DVD discs there as well. It does have a little uh, booklet in it, which is more I can say for the modern Who's that didn't have booklets. But yeah, that just gives you a bit of information about the process of this animation. Again, this is the 2016 version, and I'll just close it so we can have a look at that artwork. Oh, look at that. That's stunning. It would have been cool if it didn't have the title. That would have been cool to see. And you've got the TARDIS there landing on the planet Vulcan. Now, this is the 2016 release, and in many ways you could argue it's obsolete compared to the 2020 release we got because, you know, the animation's better, there's more special features. However, as I said, they didn't release a Steelbook for the 2020 reissue, so if you want the Steelbook edition, you've got to be content with you're essentially getting the 2016 release. This isn't too hard to come by, obviously you can't buy it new anymore unless somewhere's clear in stock, but on eBay, they pretty much go for their retail price of a little bit under. I got mine for £20, I think it retailed at 30 so they're quite easy to get hold of. Next up, from the same season, Season 4, from early 1967, we have the Macro Terror which is a four-part adventure with Patrick Troughton as the Doctor and Ben, Polly and 
Jamie, nice to have one with the three of them. All four episodes of this story are missing, so it's been animated from the ground up. Really like this cool design with the TARDIS and then the macro claws in the background. I think that's a great idea, great look for it. And then you've got just information about the story itself. Let's have a look at what the special features are. So you've got audio, episode reconstructions, a bonus mini episode. You've got animation test, you've got animation galleries, teaser trailers, a black and white presentation, a 1992 audio presentation, surviving footage, behind the scenes, a censored scene, title sequences, and for the Steelbook exclusive, ooh, exclusive stuff, we've got Gridlock. Yeah, the series, th the series 3 episode from 2007, I guess because it's got the, the macro in it, that'll be why. You've got the Doctor Who Confidential Cutdown, Are We There Yet, and the audio commentary. So, okay, the Steelbook exclusive is basically Gridlock, so it's not exclusive in terms of it's never been released, it's exclusive that you'll only get Gridlock on the Macro Terror if you get this release. Bit of a funny, bit of a funny thing to do in my opinion. Let's have a look and see what this looks like on the inside. So unlike Power of the Daleks, this is just Blu-ray discs, there are no DVDs here, and I think this is how they started doing all the classic releases from there on, making the Steelbooks Blu-ray only. Three discs there, and we'll just close that to look at the artwork, which is really cool on the, uh, again, I love that artwork design. And on the back, you've got an eerie landscape. Ooh. And it does have a little booklet as well, which details all the animation information. If you like, that's a mouthful of saying it, animation information. The Macro Terror itself is a fun four-part story. It's not one of my favorites per se, and I think I need to listen to it as an audio adventure rather than watch the animation, but if you want to see more of season four, this isn't a bad release to pick up. In terms of where you can get this from, now, I mean, I don't think you can buy it new anymore unless you get lucky. Some shops like HMV might have some remaining stock. I mean, I got mine not that recently, but when they were still getting rid of new stock, so I paid about £25, £27 for it. Again, it's quite easy to find on eBay. It's not going to set you back too much money if you want it. Next up, we have the penultimate story from Season 4, which is The Faceless Ones, which is a six-part adventure. Travel your way. I love this artwork, how it's been designed as, like, you know, an advert with the TARDIS on the runway, the plane in the background, that whole thing. The bit on the Euro has a little bit of a scuff, which is annoying because I bought this brand new from HMV. But nevertheless, this one's interesting because episodes 1 and 3 of The Faceless Ones do survive in the archives, but they did animate all six, I guess, to be consistent, if nothing else. So we'll twizzle it on round and have a look at the back. And of course, you got some blurb about the faceless ones. And what does this include? You got the color animated episodes, you got the black and white animated episodes, the original episodes one and three, good. Telesnap reconstructions of episodes two, four, five, and six, nice. You got the audio commentaries, face to face with the faceless ones, the making of. You got stock footage from the original show, surviving film fragments, the trailer. Oh, a trailer for the Fury from the Deep. Sorry, excellent. So cool, you got some nice bits and pieces on there. Now, the way to watch this, for me at least, or how I watched it, I watched it with the original episodes 1 and 3, and then watched the four animated ones. You can watch all of them animated in black and white or colour. I don't usually go for the colour versions, because usually, you know, these were made in black and white, so that's how I will watch them personally, but there's nothing wrong watching them in colour. But let's open this up, see what it looks like. Quite similar to the Macro Terror, really. Three discs on there, they are all... Blu-ray discs, and it does have a little booklet here just detailing about the Faceless Ones itself. And in terms of the story, if you want to learn my opinions on the story, I actually reviewed the the DVD version when that came out, so I'll leave a link where you can uh, check that out if you so wish to get my thoughts on it. But this Steelbook's lovely. Again, I love the whole poster feel of it. It's a really gorgeous one, probably the best-looking one of the Patrick Troughton ones, or it's certainly up there. In terms of where you can get it, again, I think you can still buy new stock if shops still have it. You know, it's going to be £25, £27. Not very expensive secondhand. And last up, but certainly not least, we have Fury from the Deep, which was actually released only a few months ago. It's a six-part uh, Doctor Who adventure with Patrick Troughton as the second Doctor, the penultimate story of season five. And this one was quite, like, hyped up in fandom for a long time. You know, it was seen as one of the best. And I feel I want to listen to it just as an audio, because watching it, I felt, as an audio, it probably works so well. Not that the animation's bad, but some parts of it, I think, leave a lot to be desired, although the team have done very well. The cover is gorgeous. You've got the TARDIS being entangled by the, the weeds here, and I love the custom text for Fury from the Deep there. On the back, you've got the Dr. Jamie and Victoria looking on. And special features, I mean, it's all there. I'm not going to get too much into this box set, only because I did a full review of this steelbook and the DVD version on my channel. At Once more, I will leave a link to that here in this video. But we will, for the benefit of this, we will open this up and see what it looks like on the inside. So like the previous two, it's three discs, all Blu-ray, of course. 
and it has a little booklet and advertisements and whatnot. Again, I'm not going to go too much in depth into the package or the story. I did that full review, so I highly recommend that you check that out. But what I will say, we will close this once again so we can look at this gorgeous artwork. Same on the back. Really, really cool there. Uh, this is the newest one. You can still buy this new in a lot of places and online. It's going to set you back £25, £27. Second hand, you might even get it for even cheaper than that. You might not get all the things inside like the booklet and whatnot, but this is the most readily available one of the bunch. So in a nutshell, those are the four Classic Who steelbooks that I own. As I said at the start, there are some that are missing, like Sharda, the Cushing movie, Spirit from Space. But I am really happy to have the Patrick Troughton animated stories on Steelbook. I mean, the covers are absolutely gorgeous on them. It's nice to have the animated versions as well with all the special features. And I hear that the Evil of the Daleks and Abominable Snowmen are next to be animated. And I'm sure, and I'm hoping, that they will also get the Steelbook treatment, because I will definitely be picking them up. As I say, these are quite inexpensive to find. Some of them are much newer, like the Faceless Ones and Fury from the Deep. These two aren't as new, but you can get them easily secondhand for not too much money. So if you want a good route into Classic Who Steelbooks, these are the ones I would recommend. But thank you very much for watching this, and indeed the entire Doctor Who uh, Steelbooks collection of videos if you've watched all four parts. If you haven't, please do check out parts one, two, and three, where we look at the modern Who Steelbooks that I own. And if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on it, and let me know in the comments. These Patrick Trout stories, do you own them on Steelbook, or have you just stuck to DVD or Blu-ray, or are you planning on picking these up? Please subscribe to the channel if you're brand new, and until the next one, I will see you guys next time.